We are in Colossians chapter 2 still, and we will pick up really, I think, where uh, Dale left off last week. And uh, this is probably kind of a section in and of itself, but you've got to break it up somewhere or me and Dale will just preach all day. It's a temptation that we fight anyway. Um, so, uh, so we had to break it up at some point, And so we stopped last week at 15 and we'll pick up this week at 16 and then go down through the end of the chapter in verse 23. So let's, uh, I will, I will read that to you and then we'll come back and, and work our way through the text because I, I think it's short enough for us to, to read and then maybe have it on our minds. So Colossians two, beginning in verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism. That's extreme self-denial. And worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. And not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. If you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Let me pray. Father, I am often keenly aware, as I am today, of my helplessness without you. And so my plea is, empower me by your Spirit so that your people will hear your voice and they will not follow another. And we praise you for hearing and answering our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Sometimes in Scripture, uh, for those of you that read your Scripture often, you'll probably uh, note this uh, with me. But sometimes in Scripture, we run across these Uh, short or pithy and powerful statements that encapsulize or they summarize the Christian life or uh, what the Christian life ought to look like, the ideal Christian life. A lot of times they are in uh, the form of a prayer. So it's something that the author of Scripture is praying for the people to whom he is writing Or sometimes it becomes at the beginning of an epistle like, I'm writing to you so that you'll live in this way. And then they give this statement of kind of encapsulating or summarizing the whole of the Christian life in just a short statement. I I, I thought uh, of it, just let me give you a couple of examples. I thought of Micah 6, 8 as an example that is kind of a pithy yet powerful statement of what what the Christian life looks like. It says, he has told you, old man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God, right? So that's short. It doesn't say everything there is to say about the Christian life, but it does kind of encapsulate it, doesn't it? Uh, Another example, for example's sake, is Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. I mean, he... He pretty much describes it right there in summary form, what it looks like or what it maybe we should say ought to look like for us to live the Christian life. There are several examples. I thought of Ephesians chapter 3 verses 16 through 19 if you wanted to look at uh, that one a little later. And 1 Thessalonians 1, 3 and 4, another, another example. Well, 
I think we have another example in the text today, or at least in the section of the text today that we're dealing with, uh, noting that we're dealing with this second section. And that's what Dale read last week and began with in Colossians 2, 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So we can see how that's a summary kind of of uh, the Christian life. We receive Jesus and then we walk in Him and we are rooted and built up in Him. We're established in the faith and, uh, and, we're, uh, and we abound in thanksgiving, or at least that is what we ought to do. And the truthfulness of these statements resonates with us, don't they? they uh, the, the truthfulness hits home with us, and it leaves us, true Christians, with the desire to live out that call. We read Colossians 2, 6, say, uh, as we have received Christ Jesus, walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, abounding in thanksgiving, and we say, yeah, that's what I want my life to look like. It resonates with us uh, and, and gives us a desire to live out that call. But if we're honest, we also look at that and realize that we fall short often, and, and it leaves us asking the question, how? I mean, yeah, I, I, want to, I want to as walk in Christ as I have received Him. I want, to, I want to be rooted and built up in Him. I want to be established in the faith, and I want to abound in thanksgiving. But how do I do that? How? As Dale began his sermon last week in the introduction... It is our tendency to attempt the how in our own strength. We start, we start wanting to live a life of faith, like Dale said last week, in the flesh. We want to do it in our, in our own strength. And this almost inevitably, and I put almost in there, just as a caveat, because there's probably somebody somewhere at some point that this may not be true of, or they make, it, make an argument that it wasn't. But, but almost inevitably, when we attempt to live out the Word of God, or uh, live out the gospel in our lives, in our own strength, it almost inevitably leads to legalism. We start wanting to plan it out, to make a calendar and say, okay, Year three, these are the things that I need to be doing. Tick, 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 tick. By the seventh year of my Christian walk, I need to uh, be praying so much uh, a day. And I need to be reading my Bible. And I need to be witnessing to this amount of people. And we start uh, checking all of these boxes and making sure that we've got everything right. I need to be doing all of these things so then I can be mature and established and, and rooted up. And uh, rooted in the faith and established in the faith, built up in Christ. We look inward to see what what can I change about myself. Or we might look outward to see what we can do to appear righteous. Or to change our circumstances so that we have the best opportunity to live righteous. And often changing our circumstances. We try to change people and we become bitter at them because they won't do what we tell them to do. If you would just quit talking to me like this, I wouldn't get so angry. Right? Or, or if, you would, if you would just quit uh, doing this, then you would quit making me sin. And so then we get bitter at them. We try to change our outward circumstances. Or we try to change our own outward appearance to make ourselves look or appear holy on the outside. Or in failing to achieve these things... We start looking downward in disgust with ourselves, don't we? Because I can't change people around me. I can't change my circumstance. I can't change myself. And we, so then we start looking downward 
in disgust with ourselves. And, and, and then, and I think y'all can y'all identify with this because even that takes on some false form of humility that we call holiness. And it turns into hypocrisy. Well, I do sin, but oh, I'm so, I feel so bad for it. Oh. And we're almost like self-flogging to make ourselves feel better. And I think all of us, as I preached, even when I dealt with the prayer back in Colossians 1, can say that none of this causes us to abound in thanksgiving, does it? And that's what Colossians 2, 6 says. So even if we might hold some appearance of, of being established in the faith or rooted and built up in Christ, it's not, we don't abound with thanksgiving. And it just turns into hypocrisy. So again, we wonder How, how, how? And Paul is going to give some instruction about the how. And remember I said when I dealt with uh, the prayer in Colossians 1 that Paul seems to be far more concerned about the who of the Christian life than he is about the how of the Christian life. And we'll get to that in a moment. But he will deal with the how in Colossians 3, 4. But before he does, he confronts the false teaching that is intriguing the Christians at Colossae and that's going around Colossae by warning and exhorting the Colossian believers about those teachings and teachers. So he gives them exhortation and warning. These are the things that, these are the things that are going on. Don't do this. That's what he says, and it starts in verse 8. See that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. So it's a warning and and an exhortation. And it begins and it continues in our text today. Dale began last week and that's that I think is the first exhortation and then Paul's rationale behind it. And then today I'll deal with the next two exhortations. That's what I'm going to be dealing with today in 16 through 23. And then I think Paul also gives rationale for each of those exhortations. And then in verse 20 through 23, uh, we'll see what I believe is the ultimate reasoning behind the exhortations, at least in our text. And I might even say that it's the ultimate reasoning behind the exhortations for everything that we have heard starting in Colossians 2.6. So the first exhortation then in verses 16 and 17 is let no one judge you on the basis of shadows and not substance. Let no one judge you on the basis of shadows and not substance. So I've already mentioned that our text today is a continuation of 2, 6 through 15 that we heard last week. And we see an evidence of that. So I didn't just come up with that to break up the sermon and justify the reason why I did it. We see an evidence of that in the way that our text begins. And it begins with that key word that we all note when we study our Bibles, therefore. So therefore, or because, because these things are true, then these things also are true or ought to be Done. Therefore, because Christ is the fullness of God, verse 9, 2 and 9, Colossians 2, 9. Because you are filled in Him, verse 10. Because you are crucified, buried, and raised with Him, and forgiven and freed by Him, verses 11 through 14. And because He triumphed over evil spiritual forces, verse 6, 15. Then 16, therefore, let no one judge you or let no one pass judgment on you. And then we see what, uh, what the teaching is that Paul is combating. It's, it's famously difficult to pinpoint exactly what it is, but apparently it had an element of Judaism, which was something common, especially in that transitional period of time in that part of the world. Judaism was strong. As a matter of fact, it was, it was Christianity uh, came, was a, had, it had a very Jewish element to it in the beginning. Uh, so, so it had an element of Judaism to it because Paul exhorts them to not let anyone judge them by, I said, 
by the shadows and not the substance. But what Paul is immediately referring to is the ceremonial law. Let no one judge you by the uh, Jewish ceremonial law. Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. And that's a reference to the dietary laws in the ceremonial Jewish law. The dietary restrictions were a part of the ceremonial law, and it was a way to keep God's old covenant people holy and distinct from other nations. Of course, you know, if you don't eat, if you don't eat pork, you you're probably uh, stand less of a chance to have a heart attack. But I'm thanking the Lord that I'm a Gentile because I'm a fan of bacon. Can somebody say amen? amen. <laughs> but the ceremonial laws were not, or the dietary laws and the food restrictions and drink restrictions were not necessarily about the health of the people of God. That was a byproduct. It was about them being distinct from the other nations and holy unto the Lord. And then Paul also references the ceremonial law when he uses a word formulation that is used in the Old Covenant, especially by the prophets, to reference the ceremonial law, kind of encapsulate or summarize the ceremonial law. And that word formulation that Paul uses is festivals, new moons, and Sabbaths. He's using the shorthand, if I could say it like that, that, uh, that the prophets used to reference these monthly feasts and observances contained in the ceremonial law of Israel. Examples of this are found in 1 Chronicles 23, 31, 2 Chronicles 2, 4, 2 Chronicles 31, 3, Hosea 2, 11, Nehemiah 10, 32 through 33. And just for reference sake, I'll read Ezekiel 45, 17. It shall be the prince's duty to furnish the burnt offerings, grain offerings, and drink offerings. And listen, at the feasts, the new moons, and the Sabbaths, all the appointed feasts of the house of Israel, he shall provide the sin offerings, grain offerings, burnt offerings, and peace offerings to make atonement on behalf of the house of Israel. So this is not a reference to the fourth commandment, which is a part of the moral law of God and is still in place today, but it is a reference to the ceremonial law, and that's shorthand for it, festivals, new moons, and Sabbaths. But then in verse 17, Paul gives the rationale behind the exhortation. Don't let anyone pass judgment on you uh, in questions of food and drink in regard to the ceremonial law. And, And then he says, it's because of this. He gives the rationale behind the exhortation. Paul says that the dietary restrictions and these monthly observations and annual observations were only meant to be the shadow that anticipated the substance of those things. They only pointed ahead. They only anticipated. And Paul says the substance of those things is Christ. So let me, uh, let me uh, make a, an attempt at an illustration about this shadow substance thing. So if I'm standing, let's say that I'm standing at the corner of of a building or behind a a pillar at uh, Jackson International Airport awaiting Madison to arrive from Alaska. Madison whom I haven't seen in a while. And I'm anticipating this, right? And I see, I'm just standing there, maybe I'm looking at my phone like we all do, or whatever, you know, whatever we're doing while we're standing around waiting. And I'm just looking down, and I see a shadow of her likeness cast on the floor. It, it lets me know that she's coming, and it, it fills me with anticipation. So I say, oh, that shadow looks like the shape of Madison. That shadow looks like the gait of, of Madison when she... When she walks. And so I see the shadow and it fills my heart with anticipation. Knowing Madison is right around the corner. However, when Madison comes around the corner, I don't embrace the shadow, do I? I embrace my daughter. Because she is what her shadow caused me to anticipate. So for the Colossians then to seek maturity by keeping the ceremonial law is to embrace the shadow and not the substance. 
is to embrace what anticipated Christ or what prefigures Christ and not embrace Christ. And Paul's going to deal with that in, in just a moment. And, and I think that we do that. Well, let me say this before I, before I get on to us here. <laughs> Further, Christ is the substance of these ceremonial, uh, ceremonial, uh, uh, ceremonial observances because He has fulfilled them. Christ is the substance. He has fulfilled them. Therefore, the Colossian believers cannot be judged based on these observances because Christ has fulfilled these things. So if it is up to me to fulfill the observances then I am judged based on my ability and someone can pass judgment on me for my inability to keep these things. I might forget something in the ceremonial law. I might miss a uh, festival or a Sabbath or a new moon. I might forget to do something and then I can be judged because of that. But because Christ has fulfilled these things on my behalf, no one can pass judgment on me because Christ has already been judged for it. Christ has fulfilled these things and true religious observance is not found in embracing the shadow. True religious observance is found in the all-supreme, all-sufficient Christ. And no, I didn't get my grammar wrong. I said that right and I want to say it again. True religious observance is found in... The all-supreme, all-sufficient Christ. You say, now wait a minute. True observance is found in worshiping, serving. eh, That's the shadow that points to the substance. True religious worship is found in Christ. We worship Him because of who He is. We serve Him because of what He is called. But true religious observance has been fulfilled not by what He has done, but by who He is. Not only by what he has done, but by who he is. True religious observance is found in the all-supreme, all-sufficient Christ and worshiping him and serving him for his glory and his sake alone. But we do this, don't we? we? We tend to do this ourselves. This isn't... And I know that a lot of us, we don't, we're not checking the Jewish calendar to see what uh, festivals and new moons and Sabbaths we need to be keeping this month or doing the ceremonial law, although that is still a temptation for folks and folks still try to do that and they misunderstand the law gospel distinction. And that's a whole nother sermon for another time. But I think that we do that, we do it in, in maybe a, even a little more subtle way, in a way that's more applicable to our everyday lives. And that is that we hold to things or observe things that are Christian, but not Christ. So we seek maturity through Christian things and not Christ. You see that? So we say, you know, I'll really be mature if I pray X amount of time today. I'll really be mature. Boy, I would really achieve some spiritual level of maturity or some high level maturity if I could just witness the 17 people this week. And, and, we, and we, you just fill in the blank. We hold fast to Christian things, but we fail to hold fast to Christ. We seek our maturity and our growth and our establishment in Him in Christian things. That's just the shadow. That's just those things that are in proximity. That, that's just the byproduct of who Christ is. No, we seek Christ. Our sanctification, our righteousness, our redemption is in Him. This is what Paul is screaming at the Colossians. All that you need is found in the all-sufficient Christ. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not preaching against prayer or theology or, uh, or witnessing or missions or work and service, and I'm not preaching it at all against that. But what I am saying is that if you're doing that and not holding fast to Christ, then that, friend, is legalism. We hold fast to Christ, and those, all of those other things flow out of that. Our maturity is not found in Christian things. 
our maturity is found in Christ. Okay, I've, have I beat that horse long enough? Next, the next section, the next exhortation, Paul says, Let no one disqualify you on the basis of external or outward experience. Verse 18 through 19. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. Again, it's difficult to pinpoint the exact error that's being propagated in, in Colossae. It was it seems to be some form of a Greek and Jewish influenced philosophy, Paul calls it in uh, verse 8 of chapter 2. And it, and it contains some elements of Judaism. I think we see that in what I just, uh, the point that I just tried to make. Then like Gnosticism, like there's some secret knowledge that, that you can attain through, through mystical experiences and then just outright mysticism with these angel worship and uh, uh, and visions and, and things of that nature. These, these false teacher, teachers were using these things, this philosophy, and they were making up qualifications for spiritual maturity, like extreme self-denial. And that's what asceticism, basically that's what asceticism is. And, or angel worship or ecstatic experiences if you if you would deny yourself enough if you would fast enough or if you would wear the right amount of clothing or if you would abstain from worldly entertainment or abstain from eating certain foods or eating at certain restaurants paul addresses all of these things all throughout his writings if you would just if you would just do that or if you would have some uh, some kind of uh, just overwhelming experience where you see visions and you're worshiping like the angels worship around the throne, all of this, then, then you would really be qualified and really be, spiritual, be brought to spiritual maturity. Angel worship, is, it, it, it's kind of a, a strange thing because it could be referencing humans worshiping angels. But there was also a kind of Jewish mysticism going around in those days that taught, and it, it does kind of fit the context if you pay attention. It taught that if a person denied themselves, that's uh, uh, asceticism. If they denied themselves enough, kept the Torah strictly enough, that deals with the ceremonial law, and, and really prayed hard enough, then they could be called up into the third heavens and somehow they themselves could participate in the worship the angels were doing around the throne of God. This is kind of speculation. Again, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly the philosophy that Paul is referencing. But whatever form this philosophy took, what it was teaching is that a person could achieve true spiritual maturity by their own efforts. And by external experiences and appearances. It taught that if the Colossians denied themselves enough, if they had just the right worship experience, or if they had ecstatic visions, then they would really be mature Christians. But Paul says, not so. In the last part of verse 18, Paul exposes, he, this is, he's exposing the character, but I think also giving the rationale behind what he is saying, don't let anyone disqualify you. He says that they are puffed up. Without reason. So they're arrogant, but they have no reason to be. In their sensuous or fleshly or unspiritual minds. They are arrogant and boast, boastful about all these visions and ecstatic experiences. But there was no reason for them to be proud about these things. These they believe themselves to be super spiritual, but in fact, they are actually unspiritual. That's the way the NIV translates the fleshly 
or sensuous mind. It's unspiritual minds. They, they believe themselves to be super spiritual, but, and they take pride in that, but actually they are unspiritual. There was no reason for them to be arrogant about their ecstatic experiences because there's a great possibility that those things only happened in their sensuous minds. They didn't actually happen. Or even, even if they did happen, Paul's going to say later, they, they're of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So there's nothing for you to be proud of. Also, he's going to say in a moment, they cause you to not hold fast to Christ. It, again, it's something that they have attached as a Christian thing, as a shadow, but they have not held fast to the substance, which is Christ. So they got, you're, you're proud, but... But you've got nothing to be ashamed or nothing to be proud of. They thought they were wise and they had reason to boast, but they were foolish and ought to be ashamed because they failed to hold fast to Christ. And Paul then goes, uses an analogy here and describes Christ as the head of the body. You may remember when Bradley preached, he talked about that in Colossians 1.18 and Paul is reaching back to use this analogy to show the Colossians that to fail to hold fast to Christ is to fail to hold fast to the head of the body. How is the body, Paul is saying, going to grow or mature without the head? You're, you're holding fast to the things of the body, but you are not holding fast to the head of the body. To be disconnected from the head is to be disconnected from the very thing that brings about true nourishment, unity, and growth in the body. So you think these things are bringing growth, but really they are disconnecting you from the very thing that brings growth. And what is the thing that brings growth? Is it prayer? Is it fasting? Is it evangelism? Is it grace? Is it the gospel? Is it attending meetings? Is it going to uh, worship? No, it's Christ. That is the head. He is the head of the body. That is what brings true nourishment and growth. Paul is exposing the utter folly of believing that a Christian can mature in their own strength because to do so, to believe that you can do it, is to disconnect from Christ, the true source of spiritual maturity. They are saying people are disqualified for exercising extreme self-denial or having these ecstatic experiences when really, in reality, it's the false teachers. They are the ones who are disqualified because they have cut themselves off from the true source of spiritual strength and maturity. And again, we are so prone to this. We so often, I'll hit this and move on, but we are so often prone to keep up appearances or, or to put our confidence in stock in our own experiences. Aren't we, aren't we prone to do that? But they don't, they, uh, they hold no value. And they are actually discouraging because if, if, if we try to do it, we will fail. And then we get disgusted with ourselves and we have guilt and condemnation and fear and anxiety and bitterness and the list can go on. Because where pride is, every evil thing exists. I think that's Proverbs. Something else that's striking to me is how doctrinal yet practical Colossians is. I mean, I'm, I'm reading this. I told someone that this, this, pa- this passage of Scripture has sp- it's spoken to- so much to me and rebuked me for probably three weeks now. Uh, I, I don't know about how, I, I'm not sure how well I'm doing preaching, but I know that in the preparation of it, it has truly helped me. But one of the things that stood out is, is how eminently practical the book of Colossians is. And when, you re, when people talk about the book of Colossians in commentaries, they're not saying Colossians is an eminently practical book. 
Normally they say it's an eminently doctrinal book because of the way that it holds up the doctrine of the supremacy of Christ and the deity of Christ even. But the reason that Colossians is eminently doctrinal and eminently practical is because you can't have one without the other. They, they work hand in glove. And I've, there's more to say about that, but I'm running out of time. Finally, in verses 20 through 23, we have the ultimate rationale for Paul's exhortations. Perhaps in the passage of Scripture, that's our text today, 16 through 23, but probably all that he has said, starting all the way back in Colossians 2.6. In verse 20, first Paul returns to, he returns to his argument in Colossians 2, 11 uh, through 15. He reminds the Colossians of their union with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. As Colossians 2, 11 through 15 state, the Colossians have been buried with Christ and raised with him as was signified in their baptism. And we heard about that last week. On this basis, Paul argues that that the Colossians have died to the world in Christ's crucifixion and they have been raised with Christ in his resurrection. So Paul's next question is, why would, would you live like you were alive to the world and dead to Christ? Or, the way he just put it, cut off from the head. The Colossians are dead to the world, Paul says. And so it's foolish for them to think that spiritual maturity will come by submitting to the perishing regulations made up by human philosophies and teachings. As a matter of fact, I think that there's a a contrast here that I believe Paul most likely had in mind. The philosophies and traditions of these false teachers stand in contrast to the teaching of Jesus. In Mark 17, four, uh, I'm sorry, 7, 14 through 23. That would have been a test, wouldn't it? Mark 17. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then also, are, are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? It enters, into his, it enters not into his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. The body has a way to take care of those things. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The false teachers are saying, if you want to grow in holiness, you're going to have to abstain from certain foods and drinks. You're going to have to observe certain rituals. And you're going to have to have certain kinds of visions or ecstatic experiences. However, Jesus teaches, if you are going to grow, you are going to have to be cleansed in the inner man. And that's where the hang-up is, isn't it? Because just like Dale said, we tend to try to live out the life of faith in the flesh. We can take care of some of the outside things. But the inner man, if you are to grow, you have to be cleansed in the inner man. And only God through Christ by the Holy Spirit can do that work. Only Christ can do that. Finally, in verse 23, Paul acknowledges that the philosophies and traditions of the false teachers do seem to be wise. They indeed have an appearance of wisdom, Paul says. It makes sense to the fleshly mind that growth or the unspiritual mind, that growth and maturity in the faith will require strict observances 
and abstinence from all sorts of food and drinks. That, that, that seems why that has a, an appearance of wisdom. It makes sense to the fleshly mind that achieving spiritual fullness will require great self-denial that will lead to mystical worship experiences and ecstatic visions. But here is the problem. Paul says in verse 23, These things are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Right? So, if we are going to, as we have received Christ, walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, just as we were taught, abounding in thanksgiving, what we don't need is the indulgence of the flesh constantly hindering us from doing that. So here's what we're thinking. Well, I'll cut the flesh off through asceticism. Or I'll cut the flesh off through being super spiritual and mystical. And Paul says, wrong. That does, that's not, these things are of no value. And I want you to note the emphasis here. No value in these things. It is not that they are helpful in moderation if used with caution. Paul says there is no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh in in these things. As a matter of fact, it may be worse than the zero value because it's apparent, according to verse 19, that the tendency of folks is to hold fast to these fleshly things instead of holding fast to Christ. Sometimes I wonder, beloved, if we have not zapped the spiritual nature right out of Christianity by making lists of things that we can do to be Christian. Beloved, if you do any Christian thing and you do it with joy, it's because of Christ working in you. I think this goes all the way back to verse 6 through 7 where Paul begins this section. He calls the Colossians to walk in Christ, to be rooted and built up in Him, and to abound in thanksgiving. And admittedly, or at least I admitted at the beginning of this sermon, that that sounds like a daunting task for anyone. How would a Christian go about doing such a thing? And the temptation is to try to achieve this goal by legalism, asceticism, or ecstatic experiences. But the problem is these things are of no value. I read a quote to you that I read this week that I thought was wise from Pastor Jeffrey Johnson. If you think that people constantly questioning their spiritual state or this introspection will produce holiness, you're dead wrong. The present confidence of salvation and the hope of future glory are what give the believer strength to endure trials. And they are also what compel the continual pursuit of Christ-likeness. God's people need much more than self-examination. They need lots of gospel hope, which flows from the confidence that they are His people. And He is their God. Beloved, this is what Christ accomplished for us at the cross. He established the new covenant and made us His people. We were no people, and He made us His people. We had a thousand gods. We were our own God, but now He is our God. And this is precisely what Paul does when he calls them to walk in Christ, rooted, built up, and established, abounding in thanksgiving. He points men to Christ. In light of this false teaching swirling around Colossae, Think of how much the letter of Colossians, the letter to the Colossians, is already dedicated to the person and work of Christ. You've got all these false doctrines, so rail against the false doctrines. No, Christ is exalted. In fact, look at how Paul begins Colossians 3. He's about to go into the how. But he begins with, if then you have been raised with Christ... Seek things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. 
The question may be if rule following, self-denial, and spiritual experiences are of no value. How will we walk in Christ? How will we be rooted and established in Him? Abounding in thanksgiving. Paul says in Colossians 3.1, Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. The Christian life, beloved, is, is not a look inward in introspection and self-examination. It's not a look downward in discouragement and constant humility. It's not even a look outward. Rather, it is a constant look upward to the all-supreme, all-sufficient Christ. It is a look at who He is. It is a look at what He's accomplished for our redemption. It is a look to Him for our present help and trial and growth and grace. It is a look at our future in Him. Beloved, you can walk in Christ. You can be rooted and built up in Him. You can be established in the faith. And you can do it all while abounding in thanksgiving. But you cannot do it in yourself. You can only do it because of and by your union in Christ and your communion with Christ. I thought of the words of the song, When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. Look up, dear ones, look up. Because that is where your spiritual fullness and maturity abides. It abides in Christ alone. Thank you, Father, for your word. It is good to us. It is a melody to our souls. It cheers us when we are discouraged. It rebukes us when we tend to pride. It lifts our face to you. We behold you in it. We behold your beauty. And it lifts our hearts to praise. And it lifts our lives to thankfulness. And let it be so according to your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.